Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, and it is great to have you join us. We are snowed out. If you're in the Chicagoland area, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so this um, means that we're going to leverage technology today, and we are going to uh, use our Facebook page to share with you this morning and invite you to join us in worship. We tried to do this last night uh, at our 5 o'clock service, and the internet was down, and we were not able to broadcast uh, last night. So we apologize for that, and uh, but we are so glad that we're up and running this morning. It was a little glitchy at the 8 o'clock service. Uh, that broadcast started out a little glitchy. We see, we'll see how it goes today. I want to welcome you. I want to encourage you to download a copy of the Order of Service. Um, it'll help you in following along with the service. I'm going to go through it with you here in just a little bit. And I want to encourage you to also, of course, use your thumbs up, your smiley faces, share this broadcast. When you do that, you're doing the work of the evangelist, and that is so awesome. Today, wow, we're going to look at a gospel reading that has something very unusual in it. Jesus goes to preach in the synagogue, and there is a demon-possessed man who confronts him and tries to shut down his preaching. And you know that's not going to go over with Jesus. He's not going to stand still for that. And so we're going to look at that, and our question that we're looking at today is, what do you do with an unclean spirit in church? Wow. Can't wait to share with you from God's Word. And a lot of practical application for us, because we may not all be fighting demons every day, but we're all engaged in spiritual warfare. And we need to understand that it's for real and how to do it correctly. So really looking forward to sharing with you from God's Word today. Um, so if you got your order of service there, uh, we're going to start with our opening hymn. I'm going to read <laughs> the first two. Uh, the, it's just two verses there. I'm going to read that for us. And, um, and then we're going to jump right into our invocation and our confession and absolution. And then we'll re we will respond. Uh, I'll read the verse of praise, uh, blessed Jesus at your word. And then we'll have our three readings, our Old Testament, our epistle. Um, and then uh, I will read uh, the verse there that we would normally sing before the reading of the gospel. Uh, I'll read the gospel for us. Then we'll have our sermon hymn, which I, I won't read that for us. It's three verses long. If you're following along the order of service, you can see that for yourself there. Then I'm going to share with you the message for this weekend. And then we will continue with the Historic Apostles' Creed, uh, prayers of the church. Also, to our prayers of the church, we're adding Angela, uh, sister of Teresa Sigmund. Uh, Angela was admitted to the hospital. She's been diagnosed with coronavirus. Her situation does not look good. So we're going to lift up Teresa and uh, all four of her siblings, including Angela, in our prayers um, this morning. Then we'll have the Lord's Prayer, and then we will not, obviously we will not have communion this morning, but we do look forward to celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper uh, next weekend in worship. And then uh, after the Lord's Supper, um, we will have the benediction. We'll have a couple of announcements. Nick Cass, our youth worker, is going to hopefully join us. He's got some super exciting announcements to share, and uh, there's a couple other great announcements we're going to share also. And then uh, closing hymns pretty short. I'll probably just read those two verses for us, and then we're going to we're going to go in peace, and we're going to serve the Lord. Amen, amen. So. Um, Welcome to Worship, fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Our opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Let me read it for us. Blessed Jesus at Your Word, we are gathered all to hear You. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to seek and love and fear You. By Your teachings, sweet and holy, drawn from earth to love You solely. Verse 2. All our knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest darkness shrouded, till your spirit breaks our night with the beams of truth unclouded. You alone to God can win us. That is so true. You must work all good within us. We make our beginning now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
As Moses speaks to the people through God, we confess those times we do not listen to your words and close our hearts to you. Forgive us, Lord. As Paul warns, we confess those times when our freedom in Christ causes one who is weak in faith to stumble. Forgive us, Lord. As Jesus, the long-awaited prophet and Savior, taught with and showed his authority and power, we confess those times when we allow the forces of evil to make us forget the deliverance and love of God we have in Christ. Forgive us, Lord. Now we continue with our time for confession and forgiveness. With David the psalmist, we humbly come before the Lord. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when they may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so as a servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, of course, we would respond with our verse of praise, being so thankful that our sins have been forgiven. I'll I'll read it for us. It's a Trinitarian verse from hymn number 904. Blessed Jesus at your word. Father, Son, and Spirit, Lord, praise to you in adoration. Grant that we may trust your word, confident of our salvation. While we here below must wander, till we sing your praises yonder. And our Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak? 
to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person has destroyed the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then this is the verse that we always sing before the reading of the gospel. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and the dreams of all. Unite them with the prayers we offer now. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. We now continue with the gospel reading, the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And then Jesus and his disciples went to, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as one of their scribes. And immediately, <coughs> excuse me, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed the man and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed. So they question among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame, that's the fame of Jesus, at once the fame of Jesus spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And then our sermon hymn is Son of God, Eternal Savior. And if you have the download of the order of service there, you can see it for yourself. We're going to continue now uh, with our message. I want to uh, begin, first of all, with extending greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's great to be here and worship with you. Again, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us via social media, which is everybody, because none of us are in the sanctuary this morning. <laughs> and so I want to encourage everybody on social media to use lots of positive emojis, thumbs up, smiley faces, hearts, all those great things when you do that. What they tell me is that, uh, according to Facebook's algorithm, you're raising the ranking of this video, and uh, it's available and more likely to be seen by more people. So you're really, you're doing the work of the evangelist just by hitting that heart or smiley face. So have at it. I see some of you guys doing it right now as we talk. That's wonderful. And, you know, if you watch later, you know, uh, in the day or tonight, hit it then too. That's great. That's fantastic. And share it on your social media. It's so great to have this technology. You know, a year ago, we didn't have this technology. And I'm, I'm really glad because the the topic for this weekend is uh, super important. I mean, it's a very unusual thing that we see happening in the text for today. Jesus has come to preach in the synagogue. And my gosh, he barely gets started, and some man jumps up and starts shouting him down, trying to interrupt his preaching. I mean, wow, you know, how awkward that would have been, how unusual, how crazy that was, right? And, uh, you know, what, what? What do you what do you do? How do you handle that? What if something like that was to happen today? You know, how would we handle somebody with an with an unclean spirit in church? You know, I, I'm afraid that many of us within the church have over psychoanalyzed uh, the references to demons in the Bible. Uh, my gosh, I mean, I hear people within uh, Christianity saying things like, well, you know, the Bible talks about demons because back then, you know, people really didn't understand the mental issues and the medical issues. And so it's just a lot easier just to just to talk about demons. And uh, and now we would call it something else. But, you know, that's what they called it back then. And, you know, there's several problems with that approach. Uh, One of the more obvious problems with that approach is that it's just not consistent. 
is not consistent to the witness of Scripture, because Scripture repeatedly shows Jesus healing people with med- with medical problems, with with all sorts of issues, and it's not always referred to as demons. And so there are times where it's a demon is involved, and there's times where it's not a demon involved. And so it's just not consistent to to use that uh, aforementioned uh, approach. Also, another rather obvious with the obvious problem with that approach is that. This event happened in a synagogue packed with people. And, you know, for, for those of you who aren't aware, um, the way worship was done in the synagogue uh, in Jesus' time was kind of interesting. The synagogues were uh, rectangular in shape. And the doorway, the main doorway in the synagogue, faced towards Jerusalem, which is kind of cool. And then the seating uh, followed the outline of the wall. And then the um, the speaker would be in the middle. And so everybody could see and everybody could hear. And so this thing that happened, happened in a, in a, in a very public way there for everybody to see. And so Jesus is, uh, you know, Jesus has a very tough situation in front of him. And, uh, and I think, you know, we need to, to not avoid this issue of spiritual warfare. When we look at the pillars of the faith, we see that, that they were very aware that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Martin Luther, in his morning prayer and in his evening prayer, had the exact same line at, line at the end of these prayers. Um, this is what he said at the close of both of his prayers. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And Luther, in his perhaps his best known hymn, A Mighty Fortress, in one of the versions of this hymn, in verse 3, we remember these words that we've sung, and, and yeah, you'll probably start humming the melody right now as I read these words to you. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill. They shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will. He can harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. One little word can fell him. Martin Luther absolutely took spiritual warfare seriously. In fact, if you ever get the chance to go to his study, uh, you'll see there on his study, and they'll point it out to you, that on the wall there's there's this ink stain, because uh, one day Luther felt that Satan was there in that room with him, taunting him and trying to distract him, and so Luther then took his inkwell and threw it at the wall, and you can see the ink there. Now, some people have wondered, you know, that happened 500 years ago, how is it that this ink is still visible on this well, maybe somebody's touched it up over the years. Be that as it may, Luther took spiritual warfare very seriously. The well-known author, British author, C.S. Lewis, is credited with saying that perhaps the greatest trick of Satan, the greatest deceit of Satan, is to get us to think that he doesn't even exist at all. Brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual warfare is a very important reality of our walk as Christians. And so today, as we look at this gospel reading, we're going to address this question, what do you do with an unclean spirit in church? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. It's new to us every morning. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for uh, the love uh, evidenced through your Son towards us, to a fallen creation, to this man possessed by this demon. We thank you, Father, that your word has authority, your word has power, and that by your word the demon is removed, and that by your word we are declared to be your children and by your word, our sins are forgiven. We thank you, Father, that your word not only has authority, but that then you give us this word of yours to go and be a blessing into this world. Help us, Father, to not only be thankful for your word, but also to be joyfully diligent in sharing this word of yours in this world. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. 
So, wow, this is quite the gospel reading, isn't it? Jesus has come into the synagogue. He's going to preach. And now he's confronted with this man who is demon-possessed. And because he's demon-possessed, he's then trying to shut Jesus down to keep him from preaching and proclaiming the word of God. One of the things to understand also about synagogue worship, I mentioned some of it before just to kind of pick up on that a little bit. One of the things to to understand about synagogue worship 2,000 years ago is that at that time in the synagogue, anybody could get up and talk. And so for Jesus to come in and talk, you know, yes, he's a rabbi, and yes, we know he's the son of God. But for him to come in and talk, that'd be fine. For some other man to step up and start talking, even crazy like this, that would be, you know, anybody could get up and talk. And when we understand that and we see in the text for today some of the problems that is attendant with that approach, we then perhaps better understand Paul's admonition, St. Paul's admonition, that, that only one person should talk at a time, right? Because we need to have, we need to have some control in here, and uh, we, we don't want to appear uh, uh, as if we're out of control, right? And so in the text for today, we see Jesus, he comes into the synagogue, and he begins to preach, and he's confronted. And so for you and I today, we need to understand the reality of spiritual warfare. And I want to talk with you about this a little bit. And the reality of spiritual warfare begins in our baptism, and it begins because of our baptism. When you are a baptized believer, you will face spiritual obstacles to include possibly demons. It's interesting when we look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, because in the Gospel of Mark, we see this Greek phrase, kai oithos. It's Greek. It simply means and immediately. And when you're familiar with the Gospel of Mark, you see that, you notice that all throughout Mark, everything happens immediately. And immediately this happened. And immediately this happened. And and we see that with, with Jesus. Uh, after he's been baptized, it's, it's kai oithos. And immediately the Holy Spirit leads him into the desert, and he's tempted and tested by the devil. And then it's, and immediately he goes into Capernaum and immediately he begins to preach when he's in the synagogue. And it's also interesting when you look at Jesus' baptism because in the Greek, it says, you know, that that the Father spoke and that the Holy Spirit descended. And that's how it's translated in English, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. But in the Greek, it's actually, the Greek word is ice, which means in or into. And so in, the, in his baptism, Jesus is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit indwelling Jesus who then leads Jesus in ministry. And... Um, it should not be surprising to us to hear uh, the fact that Jesus is indwelt by the Holy Spirit because Jesus himself says later that he and the Father are are one. And in Acts 2, verse 38, we are promised that in the waters of baptism, we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? And so then Jesus is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and immediately he's led into the desert, and immediately to Capernaum, and immediately to preach in the synagogue. And then in the text for today, we see this demon-possessed man. And when you go back in the Greeks, you see something very interesting. This demon-possessed man, it says, kai oithos. And immediately, the demon-possessed man is led into the synagogue, and he there confronts Jesus. And so you have this war of the worlds, if you will. Jesus, led by the Holy Spirit, immediately begins to preach, and immediately to... to, uh, to contrast, to, to counterattack, to try and keep Jesus from preaching, is this demon who has led this man immediately into the synagogue. And now what is Jesus going to do? And how is he going to respond? And why is it that this demon is trying to counteract Jesus preaching in this public place? You have to understand, Satan hates the Word of God. Satan hates the Word of God. And demon-possessed people are always going to try to undermine the preaching of the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is authoritative. 
And the word of God redeems this fallen creation. It was by the word of God that everything was created. And it's by the word of God that then this fallen creation is redeemed back to God. And you and I, we are engaged in a spiritual battle. We can't just, you know, try to over psychoanalyze what happens here. We have to take it for, for, for what it's worth. We have to take it at face value. We're told in other places in scripture, very plainly and very simply, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. See, it would have been so easy for Jesus to get mad at the man, but he doesn't. Jesus' issue is not with the man. Jesus' issue is with the demon. Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. This poor man, this hapless man was possessed by a demon. It wasn't his choice. He was possessed by a demon. And and we know that because after the demon is cast out, the man doesn't continue to argue with Jesus. It was the demon arguing with Jesus. And the thing we have to remember is that demons are not physical. What is a demon? Please, please. Get this. What is a demon? A demon is nothing but a fallen angel. That's what a demon is. It's another name for a fallen angel. All right. And what do we know about angels? Angels were part of God's created order. We know that a third of the angels rebelled against God and that those then we also call demons and that an angel is a is a is a created being, but it's spiritual. It's not physical. Okay, and so that's why we see, for example, you might want to write this one down. Luke chapter 22, verse three. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse three, that Satan entered Judas. And then what happened when Judas was demon possessed by Satan himself? Satan took the time out of his schedule to to enter Judas. And then Judas goes and plots the betrayal and the uh, execution, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus has just been out in the desert, right? And Satan attacked him out there and Jesus defeated him. And now Jesus is going on with his preaching ministry. He goes into Capernaum up there by the Sea of Galilee. And uh, and now he Satan has sent a demon uh, to try and disrupt Jesus' preaching, and uh, and so what does Jesus do when we look at this text? We see the love of Jesus for the fallen human race. Look at listen to these words from Mark chapter one verses twenty five and twenty six. But Jesus rebuked him. Now who's him? It's the demon. But Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, be silent and come out of him. So we know that's the demon that Jesus is rebuking. Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed the man. So he he wasn't done with tormenting this man. He convulsed the man and then cried out with a loud voice and came out of the man. Now, this man was bodily captive to an unclean spirit. And what is Jesus' response? Jesus does not drive that man out of the synagogue. No, Jesus came into this world to restore us into a right relationship with God. He came to save this world through his atoning death and sacrifice. And the fact of the matter is that that you and I, when we enter into this world, when we are born, we are born spiritually captive to original sin. We are dead in our trespasses. And, and, and so what is Jesus' response to this human race created in his father's image, born dead to sin, uh, born captive to original sin? Jesus reaches out to children and to their parents and to his disciples, and he says these words in Luke 18, 16. Let the little children come unto me. Let the infants and the children come unto me, and do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Can we give God a thumbs up? I see you guys doing this, hearts, smiley faces, for the love of our Savior Jesus, for his desire to restore us into a right relationship. See, not only does Jesus reach out, but we We also see here that Jesus rebukes all evil voices. Yeah, that demon got loud, but Jesus got louder. And I'm here to tell you something. The day is coming soon and very soon when there's going to be a judgment. And on judgment day, you're probably going to hear all kinds of voices. You're going to hear people talking. You're going to probably hear demons talking. You may hear Satan talk. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to say it clearly. On Judgment Day, there's going to be but one voice that counts, and that is the voice of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
And it's going to be that voice that welcomes you as his brother or as his sister and, and to enter into the, into the home that he and his father have prepared before you. You know, Luther said it like this. He said, Satan likes to accuse me of sins I've done, this and that and the other thing. And finally, I learned this, that what I need to say to Satan is simply this. You accuse me of sin? So what? So what? I have not sinned against you, but as David said in the Psalms, O Lord, only against you have I sinned. And so when the voice of the accuser troubles your conscience and says to you, you did this wrong, you should have done that, but you didn't do it. Tell him like Luther, so what? So what? I haven't sinned against you, and your word has no authority over me. Your word has no authority. The word that has authority over me is the word of my heavenly Father, through his Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you see, Jesus has routed the enemy. He has defeated sin and death and the devil. And I want to encourage you today to please, if you've never received this gift this gift that Jesus gave to this man in the temple, this gift that Jesus gives to us through his resurrection on Easter morning. If you've never received this gift or a victory over sin and death and the devil, receive it today because he wants you to be blessed with it. The word of God has authority. The crowd there in the synagogue recognized that. Look at verse 27. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. The word of Jesus still has authority. It's the authority of Jesus' words. When he says, Take and eat, this is my body given to you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, this cup is the new covenant in my blood given to you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. It is the authority of Jesus' word that makes that bread and that wine able for God to give us the grace that Jesus, Jesus tells us that we get in communion. And it's the authority of the Word of God that gives baptism its power, that otherwise it would just be water. But because of the authority of the Word of God, our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit indwells us also. It's because of the authority of the Word of God that we can forgive each other sins. And this is what Jesus not only gives us the authority to do, but he expects us to do. And that's why our mission statement is so important. And we know our mission statement, don't we? That we're going to glorify God by spreading this gospel, by spreading this word, because it has authority. And we're going to do that by focusing on three things, and we know what those three things are. We're going to focus on our preaching. We're going to focus on our teaching. I can hear you guys saying it. And we're going to focus on living our daily lives. And boy, spiritual warfare is all about how we live our daily life. And so I want to wrap up the message for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany by focusing on the very last verse from the Gospel reading. It says, And the fame of Jesus grew and spread throughout that region. Let that be our verse for this year as we come through and come out of this coronavirus. Let that verse be our focus, that we, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting in the authority of his word, that we will be his vessels and his instruments for the fame of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, to increase in our area. Amen? Amen. What do you do with an unclean spirit in church? You get it the heck out of church, and you love the man or the woman who was afflicted by it. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep all of our hearts and all of our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, we're going to continue now with the historic Apostles' Creed. Let's confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the church. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures, both law and gospel, in which we see our sin and your love in our Savior. As Christ is true prophet and Savior of this world, give us faith to continue to hear his voice and find comfort in his work of salvation. Bless the proclamation of the word and raise faithful servants who will share your commands and the forgiveness that comes through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-giving Lord, grant continued faith by your Holy Spirit through the hearing of your word, that we would be fed and nourished, produced in us good fruit for the sake of selves and others, that we not cause others to stumble, but rather to walk firmly in your ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, guard our families and homes and build them up in love. Support parents in their task of instructing their children. Strengthen those whose faith is weak and make us bold to forego convenience and security to attest the truths of our most holy faith with heart and our action. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, give health and success to our president and governor, our legislators and judges, and all who serve for our governance and protection. Make them high in purpose, wise in counsel, and unwavering in duty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All-powerful Lord, at whose word and authority even unclean and evil spirits submit and obey, hinder the work of Satan in our lives so that your kingdom and victory will be known to all. Give your peace and presence to those who suffer any affliction, including Paula, Angela, Mary Ann, Carol, Pat, Russell, Tim, Irma, Margie, Kirk, Margie, Jerry, Thomas, Jackie, Nancy, Betty, Eric, Lisa, Mike, Rose, and Inga. Enable us to be a blessing to those in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we have need of, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're not going to have uh, communion this morning, obviously. We do look forward to celebrating it uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. And so then we'll continue now with uh, the benediction. Then we have some announcements and, uh, and then our closing hymn, which I'll read for us. And then we'll go in peace and we will serve. We will continue to serve the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. All right, guys, we are um, going to try now to bring Nick um, on to the announcements. And so, uh, Nick, if you can hit your request button there, I'm not seeing it here. I see that you're watching, but I'm not seeing your request button for me to click you in. So if, if you can do that, um, I'm going to, I'm going to click you in. And if it doesn't work, I've got your announcements and I can cover them. Uh, so, so um, we'll give Nick a second here, um, and and while we're while we're doing that, I just want to say again hi to everybody who's joined us via social media. It's great to to have you. And um, if you're not a member, I want to just ask you just to plug your ears for just a second because this next thing is just members only. For our members, there's a donate button there, and um, and if you haven't had a chance, to, I want to encourage you to uh, click that button. Uh, I see Nick here, and so I'm going to try and bring. 
him on camera. I apologize for my hand there. Um, Nick, we're trying to get you in here, brother. Let's see. Bring him on camera. There it is. Oh, Nick, we're trying. Let's see here. Well, Nick, I'm not having, I don't think I'm having any luck here. Well, hmm. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go on. Nick, I'm gonna cover your announcements for you. Uh, it's been great to have you on. Uh, so then, um, if you have any pre for, for everybody, I apologize for that. For everybody who's who's watching, um, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, we'd love to hear from you. Use our prayer app. It's embedded all over the place on our Facebook page and on our website. Our prayer team would love to pray with you and pray for you. We will continue to have our daily devotions every night at 7.15, and our focus uh, now is a family prayer walk. And I was invited to join Jane Haas who retired from Concordia Publishing House as an editor. You've seen her name on all kinds of books as the editor of them. She and I are working with Kay Meyer, the founder of Family Shield Ministry, to put this training resource together. So I want to invite you to join us for the uh, my devotional this week, which is focused on a family prayer walk. Tuesday night, a little bit before the devotional, uh, we were gonna, I we're going to have a Hispanic theological training. We have four students in that. We're going through the doctrines of Scripture, and it's just going so wonderful. We're so excited about the doors that God's opening to share the authority of God's Word with our Hispanic neighbors in Lake County. So we praise God for that. Uh, we are so blessed to have Nick Cass as our youth worker, and he does so much in uh, in our ministry. And so just a couple of highlights for you, and he'll be in person with us next week to share this with you. First of all, our Lenten series, we're going to involve our middle school youth in that. We're going to have dramatic dialogues. I'm super excited. Nick's doing an awesome job working on that. And Nick's doing Zoom Sunday School, and we have like 20 kids in that. And so if you want to be a part of that, you don't know, or you got grandkids or, you know, uh, godchildren, and you want them to be able to use this, reach out to our church office, reach out to Nick, and Nick will get you the information on how to do that. And Nick's already working on VBS uh, with key leaders for this coming summer. And that was one of the things that we just felt so attracted to Nick in the interview process, because he was part of a dynamic VBS ministry at his previous church. And we are so looking forward to what God's going to do through him here. So we praise God for that. Our voters meeting got pushed back because of all that beautiful white stuff falling out of the skies and uh, so it's been pushed back two weeks there'll be more information coming out to you but it's scheduled now for February 14th after the 1030 service Ash Wednesday February 17th, we're going to have the imposition of the ashes. Um, we will offer the imposition of the ashes uh, during service as well as after service in the parking lot for those who don't want to come in. Um, we are so blessed to have a nurse uh, in our congregation, Teresa Sigmund, who also manages 75 nurses. And I reached out to her for wisdom on how to do this in a safe, medically safe way with the virus. And so we're going to use, uh, I'm going to be using a little latex gloves, one, one use per person. And we're going to make the imposition of the ashes. And uh, we're going to do that in the sanctuary and after each service. Also, for the first time ever, we're going to be going out to our sick and shut-in members and offering imposition of ashes to those who want to receive it. And finally, I am so excited to tell you we're going to be starting a new membership class. And it's going to start February 14th. It'll be at 915. And uh, you can uh, participate in that online uh, or come to the church and participate in person. Um, if you have not received your letter, please just RSVP through the office, talk to Marie, and we will get you set up. God is doing fantastic stuff at Faith Lutheran Church. Amen? Amen. There's not a demon that's going to stop him. And it is so great to walk in the footsteps of our Captain Jesus in the victorious team that he has put together. Amen? And so that's our closing hymn, Jesus, Lead Thou On. Number 718, let me read verses 1 and 2. Jesus, lead thou on till our rest is won. And although the way be cheerless, 
we will follow calm and fearless. Guide us by thy hand to our fatherland. If the way be drear, if the foe be near, let not faithless fears overtake us. Let not faith and hope forsake us. For through many a woe to our home we go. Amen. Now let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.